welcome to our last panel. And just as a, like for everyone who's low on energy after a long day yesterday and maybe even a long night as well, and uh, two very interesting but also quite, um, quite long panels already this morning. What we agreed on here, in the, uh, like among us sitting here, is that we, want, uh, we will not have any more presentations. We, will have, we want to have a conversation and not only here among us in the, in the panel but also with you guys. And um, also, then also to use this panel discussion, like this last discussion, um, as a kind of um, reflection on the conference, uh, as a way of looking forward and looking at um, and discussing maybe what could be the next steps to take, what can we still learn from each other, what can we improve, and uh, and so on. Because, um, like, except Peter Scherrer, uh, who has joined us today from the European Trade Union Confederation, um, we have here Ananya, Tomislav, and Roland, who have all joined the international or transnational labor debates also yesterday in this conference. So we, we decided to not kind of like repeat what we talked about uh, yesterday, but to kind of like try to build onto that. And maybe just for all of us, to um, to to remember, I think what we what was what was quite clear or became clear yesterday is that we have quite common or similar challenges as trade unions or as labor activists. Um, although the specific realities and specific struggles might be different and also the, the, the room to maneuver, the, the, the space to maneuver for trade unions and activists are quite different in the different countries. But if you talk about globalization, uh, the attack of neoliberalism on labor, precarization and flexibilization of labor, this is something that kind of um, uh, affects all of, of our work. And uh, not the least the, the fact that most of the produ products today are produced in transnational production network, value chains, and so on. Um, during the, the workshops, we discussed quite different experiences, like coming from clean clothes campaign, coming uh, from looking at the logistics sector, on the other hand, um, as a growing sector that, comes, um, that becomes even more important today in a, um, um, but it's not really in the in the view as a strategic point maybe for campaigning um, but also at the in a way at the role that critical research that NGOs and um, and trade unions can work together for a similar uh, like for for similar goals and this kind of then also picks up what uh, what was was discussed in a way in the first panel today and what is this panel's role now? <laughs> In my suggestion is that we uh, try to follow up yesterday's discussions and bring in a more strategic perspective. So what can we do together? What needs to be done? And um, what can we improve um, after all these uh, debates and learning from each other uh, and seeing what others are doing? What can we improve in our own work? What can maybe also we, um, we see what um, uh, what we can, what RLS can maybe also bring into this uh, to this exchange, and um, so I was I would start with one round here um, um, in the panel uh, on the question of how can we use existing the existing instruments, the existing collaborations, uh, existing international or European. Uh, trade union, collaborations, federations, institutions, um, um, how can we use them better? Because one of the things that Tomislav pointed out yesterday was that very often this, that they don't work. There is a lacking connection also between the local struggles and global, um, global union federations, global framework agreements, how they can actually be used and so on. So we looked a lot uh, also on things that didn't work and then the question now would be how can it work and how can it maybe be bet uh, work better? How can we use the existing instruments more effectively? And, um, and um, this is maybe something that Peter can start with and then um, I have like a, 
similar question, like the same question also for Ananya and Peter uh, and Tomislav, maybe with a specific uh, side note for you guys. I think, does it work? Yeah. Thank you very much uh, for the invitation and the possibility to, yeah, to make a few remarks about what we are doing with regard to organizing transnational labor solidarity. Uh, you listed me here in the, uh, in, uh, when you have the list of speakers, it's Peter Scherer, ETUC Germany. <laughs> yes, all trade unionists in European trade union organization have to come from somewhere, yes. and that is correct. I'm uh, from Germany, but the, the uh, ETUC is in Brussels, mm -hmm. and normally I would, uh, don't, I would not mention it, but it's important for, uh, to, to put the stress on this fact that we are based in Brussels, because uh, when we want to discuss about organizing transnational labor solidarity, it is important to underline that we are a European organization which has the, the headquarter in Brussels. That is, uh, of course, uh, owed to the fact that we have, uh, we have some, some organizations and some institutionalized uh, uh, ways to make ourselves heard, and we have to address our demands uh, to the European Commission, to the European Parliament, to the European structures. Uh, but at the same time, it shows uh, that uh, we are a European organization with many, many members, uh, and we have 89 members uh, in 35 countries, so not just the European Union, it's uh, uh, European countries, uh, uh, the organization of European countries in general, and in total we have uh, 43 million members still, although we face, of course, uh, like uh, like we have seen in many national uh, uh, cases uh, on a European uh, overall on the European level, we unfortunately face a, a drop of membership as well. But currently, uh, it, the the situation is comparatively stable. Uh, so, uh, with the, after the uh, big shock uh, uh, with regard to membership uh, uh, loss uh, in the during the crisis, now 2009, 2010. 11, in some countries we even have more members now, and uh, so it's a positive development, but overall the, the, the development is pretty fragile. But coming concretely to uh, organizing transnational labor solidarity, um, I could now work on many, many uh, different uh, and, and, and specific uh, examples, but since we we do not have that much time, I would like to concentrate on uh, on one uh, way to organize uh, solidarity uh, very much in particular, and that has something to do with my background. I'm by uh, um, by my my trade my whole trade union life. And I'm 43 years now member of the metal workers. I'm my whole trade union life. I was working in the metal uh, uh, industry apart from three years in the agriculture industry. I was international uh, uh, international secretary of the intern of the agriculture workers trade union in Germany, and uh, so that is a very. And since we have uh, in the metal industry, we have a big, uh, uh, yeah, quite a few big players which have uh, yeah, plants all over the world. I, I, I will not start with the automobile industry. There it's very obvious, but, but uh, for example, much uh, smaller scale, but still very much uh, Europeanized and, and uh, globalized is uh, the automobile uh, supplier industry, for example, or the steel industry, uh, or the whole uh, electric, electric industry, and so on. So we have, uh, we have uh, by nature, by, by, by nature of this industry already a global, yeah, it, the work has to be global. And a very concrete example for, uh, for, for right now is uh, the merger of uh, the companies ThyssenKrupp and Tata Steel in Europe that will be, that will be now the second biggest player in Europe. And they, their, uh, uh, their statement was, we will merge and uh, the merger will cost at both ends 
for the Tusen Krupp workers and the Tata workers 2,000 jobs. And uh, we will uh, now, our headquarters will be shifted from Germany to the Netherlands. And we all know Germany, we have stronger trade union uh, uh, participation rights, uh, stronger uh, workers' participation rights, strong uh, position of works council who can defend the interest of the workers. They will shift that to Netherlands, and in the Netherlands it's weaker. It's certainly weaker. So it's, it means for us immediately this merger has serious consequences, and in particular for the four, for the four thousand workers, yeah, because they will, will will be made redundant. So, and we have to organize solidarity, and that is what we do. Uh, uh, we do that in the uh, in the frame of our federations. We have uh, in total ten federations as member of the confederations, and they organize meetings. They organize solidarity that the workers. Speak can speak vis-a-vis -vis the management with one voice when they want it, yeah? And that is, uh, here I come to a very compli uh, complex point. We have an institutionalized uh, 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 tool to, uh, to present our demands vis-a-vis -vis the management. That is the European Works Councils. And there we have European Works Councils, and they have the possibility to even sometimes to negotiate with the management. But uh, in this case, for example, it's not so easy to organize one voice, because our British friends have a different view uh, with regard to this merger than the German colleagues. The German colleagues see it very, they, they will lose a lot and they see it as a big danger. And the British colleagues see there are some chances in it. Uh, and Tata was negotiating already beforehand with the British colleagues about pension schemes and so on and, and uh, uh, the golden handshake uh, issues, for example, so that, you, that you, when you will become redundant that you have some, some compensation money and so on. So the point is we have now partly negotiation going on in some plans. And in other plants, they still are pretty much fighting. And now we, as a European institution, we should organize the one voice, which is, speaks with one voice against uh, or to the management. And that is pretty difficult. And there, I would, uh, as a start, I finish here. It's our, it's our uh, I think we, we, we do it, but we certainly, we don't do enough to organize the to organize the cooperation of the various workers' representatives in Europe. We should do more. Uh, we should do more ac activities around works councils or workers' representatives, because they are pretty much uh, diff they, they differ very much all over Europe. But we, uh, and we, we have good examples where we were able to organize a, a process where the workers could speak with one voice. We were able to, to make a difference and to safeguard jobs. We were even able to safeguard or to prevent closures of plants uh, so people were not made redundant. It's a hard work and in my opinion, my personal opinion is we as trade unions do not invest enough in it. Because I think the real power of trade unions is not, uh, is not how many uh, Facebook clicks we have. The real power is in the companies, and that we do have to organize. Thank you very much. And by the way, I would like to make one comment. I listened very carefully to, to what our uh, Slovenian colleagues presented. And that is pretty much down to earth. And the last presentation was uh, where they said we, in this uh, Cetra, uh, where they organize uh, cooperation, stronger trade unions help weaker trade unions. I think that is the right approach. Thanks a lot. I think you mentioned, like you pointed out, like a couple of very crucial issues, like the question of how can we speak with one voice or how can we organize like practical solidarity in, t in times where uh, we often see that there is like um, there is a problem. There is really the problem that not everyone has the same interests uh, or um, feels that they have the same interests. So maybe Ananya, like uh, you have quite also a couple of decades of experiences of uh, labor organizing. 
in in the Asia Flow Ridge campaign in SLD, and um, what would your uh, what would your conclusions be? How can we speak with uh, one voice? Like the Asia Flow Ridge campaign is, for example, was a very or is a very ambitious uh, endeavor to quite, to try to <laughs> unite unions to speak with one voice in a way to find a, to find a common claim of common demand, and how. Um, how can we maybe learn from your experience of doing that? Uh, what could maybe be um, a recommendation or a view from South Asia, from Asia to also the region here, to Europe or specifically to Southeastern Europe, how we can, um, how we can uh, improve transnational cooperation? Uh, <clears throat> I know everybody is tired, so am I. Um. <laughs> I'll try to, even though I missed the party last night. Uh, so I got a bit more sleep. Um, uh, well, it's it's a little bit difficult to plunge into the Asia Floor Bridge Alliance experience because I want to be brief, and, and that won't be brief. Uh, definitely having a very concrete, focused demand helps. So living wage is, uh, is a focused demand. However, to achieve that focus took a lot of work. To achieve that focus, not from the top, but in a bottom-up way, took a lot of work. It, it, we, we had to, uh, first of all, uh, Asian unions uh, are not in the habit of sitting together unless they're conv convened by, um, Global unions or or some regional um, you know uh, bodies, but at the same time a blessing of some kind of a global union frame. So I think part of the process was just to uh, say that unity is possible on this issue, not to get dissuaded by people who kept saying that wage uh, can never be decided at a regional level, only national definitions are possible. And we made, uh, it took us about two years to build the unity, to build the information base, to build capacity to come up with a consensus on a regional living wage. It was uh, hard work and uh, we did not always have the support of uh, everybody concerned because we found that in Asia, when we are trying to organize Asia-wide for a global demand, the politics of global unions uh, play a very strong role because we were not part of any global union formation. Um, you know, some of us belong to global unions, some of us didn't. And... Uh, Somehow, when you start doing global work, global unions feel a bit threatened. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes they really like it and give you a lot of support. But sometimes they can feel threatened and say that, oh, gosh, you're doing what, you know, you're kind of stepping on our turf. In our case, uh, it was not a negative, uh, it was a negative thing rather than a positive embracing. So that took some uh, doing to kind of, you know, figure out the politics of it. The point is to remain very focused on what it is we are trying to achieve. And these politics, uh, to, to just see them in a problem-solving way and not get overcome by, you know, this is not right and self-righteousness on all of that. It's to always remain open so that sometimes people can be hostile to you at the beginning, but as you warm up, they come back to you. And so that road, that door always has to stay open. If somebody who didn't like you at the beginning likes you later, you can't, uh, at least that person should be able to say, hi, I'm, I'm here, instead of like, gosh, if I come, she's going to attack me or he's going to attack me. So, so I think that um, just solving problems on the way, not let politics kind of make us emotional. These are just uh, problem solving coming to consensus in a very focused way, stay focused on the goal. I think these are uh, important things. Um, I think that as we build 
power in a world where union density is low, and in metal it's actually higher than some of the other sectors, though I know I'm also doing some auto parts organizing and it's a zero union where I am. But, um, you know, at least I know I have colleagues who have foothold in, you know, auto parts. It's a, it's a, it still has, what should I say, um, enclaves of union strength. Um, some of the other sectors are facing zero unionism. Uh, so, so as we kind of go into these things, then we have to also take into account that given less union density, the importance of alliance building becomes very important. We can't wait for the perfect formation of unions in everything. So we have to also work with workers' association, women's organization, um, you know, other types of non-governmental uh, entities that are bringing people together. As long as collectivities are happening in some form or the other, we have to keep, uh, you know, working on that. And the, maybe the third thing I would say is that I would agree with uh, Peter that, uh, you know, stronger unions and others who have said stronger unions help weaker unions. However, let us not kid ourselves that strength also means us power. So people who are stronger have power in some way, and they will help in a comfort zone of that power. You know, they, they are powerful in a particular way, and the way they will help is something that keeps that particular zone growing. So it's very few people I find and very few global unions who will actually step out of the comfort zone and say, I know you are not even in my sector, or I know that your work could be a little bit challenging to my work, but I'm going to step out of my comfort zone and help you. So I think that uh, stronger unions helping weaker unions need a tremendous amount of wisdom and enlightenment on the part of the stronger unions. So that uh, is not always easy to come to. The last point I will make is just generally what I'm finding is that, at least in India, this is what we are seeing, and in my uh, some of the sectors that I'm in, we are seeing that, is that, um, you know, uh, in, we all know that one of the best ways to disorganize trade unions is to bring precariousness into the situation, make the employment very unstable, uh, make workers very vulnerable, um, vulnerable in, in not always economic ways, make them very just uncomfortable. It's always changing. Anything that is changing and unstable is, is a sure sign of disorganization of unions. And this is what we are looking at. So in fact, in India, what I'm finding is that the government is declaring a certain, in garment this has happened, the government declared a certain higher wage for temporary workers, okay? Which was even lower than what regular workers would get. And that took, uh, took the carpet from, uh, not that we have carpets, it they, they takes the floor out uh, from beneath our feet, you know, because we can't go to the temporary worker and say, hey, you know, look, the regular worker is getting paid so much higher than you are. They took that right out, you know. So what they said is that we will, uh, we want that precariousness and the mobility in, uh, and the st uh, instability to stay, but we will give the carrot of a slightly higher pay so that the temporary worker does not see the benefit of joining regular workers. It's like, hey, I'm doing better than you are type of situation. But what is, of course, the because workers are so poor in some of these sectors, that what they don't see is that the wage got a bit higher, you are still unstable, and what you have lost is social security. You have lost certain benefits. For that, you have got a slightly higher wage. So the worker goes home thinking, okay, I've got a slightly higher wage, and a lot of these are young workers. So social security is a bit lower down in their priority if they're young workers. You know, my pension, I'll worry about it later, that type of thing. 
So, so there is this game that is being played with regard to wage and precariousness and the, and the way th the very intelligent thinking is going on if a temporary worker is given a slightly higher wage than a regular worker. I thought this was brilliant. It broke our union in a factory. So uh, that's... Thanks. Um. Thanks. Now, Tomislav, I was told to ask you to only uh, tell me two things now, after the four things uh, Ananya said, but uh, maybe you can point out two things that you, would, that you think how um, unions here in the region in Southeast Europe can um, improve their use of international instruments and um, how we can maybe also deal with the different positionings of unions in, uh, with, within this cooperation. Like there's weaker unions and stronger unions and we just had the, heard that both uh, Peter and Anya, Ananya pointed out that it is necessary to help each other. How could that look like? Pokušat ću odgovoriti na ovo pitanje, iako ja sada sam sa sobom imam dosta velikih problema, imao sam sasvim drugi koncept u glavi, sad ga moram na brzaka promijeniti i mislim da ću to sasvim uspješno učiniti. Za ono što ja želim reći, bitno je znati moju sindikalnu poziciju. Moja sindikalna pozicija je bitno drugačija od sindikalne pozicije kolega iz Svedera, kako da to kažem, on živi u neboderu, živimo u istom neboderu, on je na 186. katu, ja sam u prizornu stanu. Međutim, kad dođe poplava, ja prvi poplavljujem. A oni se gore dogovaraju s kojeg telefona će meni zvati pomoć. To je nešto što ja cijenim, što je u redu, ali nama ovdje ili sindikatima, to sam zaboravio reći, moram to ponoviti, mi smo sindikat koji je relativno mali broj članova, međutim ne smatramo se slabim sindikatom, jer je naša akcijalna spremnost dosta velika. I sindikat smo koji, tako da kažem, raste. Mi smo rijetki koji se možemo pohvaliti da konstantno rastimo sa prvim svojih članova. I mi točno znamo što nama treba. Ja s ceste vićem u pomoć veliki brate Tukume, a dobijem poruku pošalji mi molbu u dva primjerka taksiranu sa markama, s taksenim markama. Ono što treba isto tako reći, to je vrlo zato što mi kao sindikat, pa ni centrala u Hrvatskoj, kojoj ja pripadam, nažalost nije član niti jedne od svjetskih sindikalnih organizacija. To očito pravi određenu distinciju, ja to mogu razumijeti i to je meni ok. Međutim, kao što Anjanja kaže, izađemo malo iz tih konfornih zona. Mi nismo čak niti granski sindikat. S nama svi imaju problema. Kad se hoćemo negdje prijaviti da se učlanimo u nešto, kažu iz koje ste vi grane? Pa iz svih. Mi skupljamo članovi koji imaju problema i pomažemo svojim članovima. Kako to može izgledati ovdje ovako na jugu Evrope? Ja ću reći da jedan od mojih ideala je ono što su napravili kolege i kolegice iz Azije, to je Azija Floor Wage. Zašto mi ne bi imali South East, South Europe Floor Wage? Ako su oni mogli, vjerojatno možemo i mi, ili ćemo jednostavno priznati da su oni pametniji od nas. Pa dobro, ako to treba priznat, priznajmo, ali to je recimo jedan stvar procesa u koji bi po meni u svakom slučaju trebalo krenuti. Jer to je nešto što u suradnji možemo napraviti za dobro iz svih naših članova. Ako sam već na radionici rekao, mi imamo tu i strahovito puno problema. Jedan od mojih odgovora kako možemo raditi zajedno je napravimo internacionalni sindikat, sindikat koji neće poznat granice. Tad sam upozoren od kolege i hvala mu to upozorenje sam primio da te granice ipak postoje. Bajakovo postoji, Stara Gradiška postoje, Načkanjiža postoji i to su naše realnosti. Međutim, problem je nas sindikata što se u vlastitim zemljama i u ovom okruženju ponašamo kao indijanska plemena pred navalom bijelac. Gazija nas jednoga po jednoga, jednoga po jednoga, zaboravljamo u principu da smo u stalnom i konstantnom, u principu klasnom sukobu, između rada i kapitala. 
bez obzira kako je bilo koji sindikat obojen u nekom političkom smislu i totalno bez boje, oni su jedni od predstavnici onih koji su tu pripadnici radništa, pripadnici te neodriđene klase. To isto tako u tom dijelu ne treba zaboraviti i tu treba naći motive za zajedničku suradnju. I slažem se opet sa Njanjom, rekao sam već da će ovaj panel gledat, slažem se sa Njanjom ili obrnuto, trebamo naći jedan određeni fokus, jedan određeni zajednički cilj, interes, jer to je ključno u svakom djelovanju sindikata i to je ključno u postojanju sindikata. Kad nađemo zajednički interes, pretpostavljam da ćemo se bitno lakše dogovoriti i kojim jezikom ćemo pričati i pričat ćemo jednim jedinim glasom ukoliko je naša želja da taj zajednički cilj ostvarimo. A što se tiče ovih nekakvih akcija, gledajte, nama trebaju akcije koje su životne akcije. Bez obzira da li nam zakoni to koji put dozvoljavaju, ne treba naći određene kreativne premosnice. Novi sindikat je kao jedna od kreativnih premosnica našao svoje povezivanje sa Clean Clothes kampanjom, jer kao već nisam se mogli uključiti u nekakve sindikalne međunarodne udruge, da bar imamo prozor u svijet i sad ga imamo i pomažemo i njima i oni nama, kupljamo kontakte i uključujemo se u akcije. Evo, mi smo kao sindikat izveli jednu nedavnu akciju koja je prva takva akcija na ovim terenima za koju ja znam. Ako ja nešto ne znam, nemojte mi zamjeriti. Kad smo, ne su radnje sa sindikatima, tada ih još nije bilo, unatoč tome što između srpskog radništva i hrvatskog radništva postoje nekakvi povijesni problemi, mi smo jednostavno odlučili se držati sindikalnog principa, a to je da sindikat ne prepoznaje granice, da sindikat ne prepoznaje boju kože, da sindikat ne prepoznaje naciju, nego prepoznaje ono što ja volim reći šljakera u nevolji. I mi smo, ljudi to nisu vjerali, organizirali akciju potpore na ulicama u gradu Zagrebu. To su sindikalne akcije kakve nama trebaju, jer upravo je kolega kad kaže, sindikat je jak, koliko mu je jako članstvo. Sindikat se gradi do zdola. Ta akcija je bila akcija, možemo diskutirati, ona bila velika, ili ona bila mala, ili ona bila uspješna ili neuspješna, ili ona bila vidljiva ili nevidljiva, bila je vidljiva koliko može biti, bila je velika u datom momentu koliko može biti, a reći ću vam da nisam specijalno bio jako zadovoljan, da su postali samo jednog policijskog službenika danas pazi, što inače kod nas nije običan, obično ih bude podosta više, ali je akcija bila. I to je ono što je važno, što je važno za reći. Možemo ju kritizirati, možemo ju hvaliti, ali bez takve akcije i bez tog dijela nemamo o čemu razgovarati. I spremni smo to raditi opet. Ja nisam u sindikalnoj poziciji da rješivam svjetske krize, ali mogu rješavati ove naše male međusobne krize. I ono što je najveći uspjeh te akcije, to je što imamo informaciju, kontaktu sam i ja telefonsko sa ljudima iz Vranja, to je njima značilo. To je njima značilo. Poslije toga, kad sam došao dole u Vranje, moram reći da sam primijetio sjaju u onom njihovom oku. Kad su se toga sjetili, kad sam ih pozdravio, samo su imali će rekli su hvala gospod Kiš, hvala gospod Kiš. Iako se ja ne osjećam ništa, to je onaj dio solidarnosti koji nama treba. Sam ja dugačak. Pa mi smo, da, mi smo organizirali akciju na veliku, bilo skupljeno se jedna dvadesetak iz Bredučana Geoksa u gradu Zagrebu. Došli smo sa transparentima da nismo smijeli napisati Hrvatsko radništvo, jer ga mi ne predstavljamo, ali smo rekli da razništvo u zoni odgovornosti novog sindikata podržava borbu radnika u Geoksu i njihovu borbu protiv loših uvjeta. Dijelili smo tamo letke ljudima koji, šta u stvari mi to podržamo? Da ljudi ne nose pele, da imaju pravo otići na toalet, da imaju pravo na čisti zrak i da imaju pravo na piti vode za vreme radnog vremena. I nije to bila nekakva wow akcija, nije to bilo nešto super, ali ljudi, bilo je. I to je poanta priče. Ok. Thanks, Tomislav, also for this uh, very practical exper uh, like example from, from your work of the last uh, year, practically. I think it's now about a year of um, um, supporting the struggle of the workers at Geox. I want to open one additional topic. Like we talked about using the instruments better and like how we can like form common demands and um, <clears throat> 
and speak with one voice and so on. And I think there's another issue when we come to um, when we come to international collaboration of unions. That means that it's not only about supporting concrete labor struggles, which is important, which is and which is the basis of, of of course, this um, collaboration. But it's also, I think, about tackling the political field and the frameworks that influence the work of unions. Um, Can you just repeat? I, I, the, I think that we need to that we should discuss also when we talk about perspectives of international collaboration and uh, of international trade union work and not only of unions but also of labor activists, that there is the political field in terms of labor legislation, in terms of industrial policies, in, per in terms of foreign direct investment policies like we had yesterday evening at the event, that of course influences massively uh, labor fights, labor, uh, uh, the situation of work, of workers and so on. And so how can we maybe, not, like as trade unions, as activists, as NGOs, as you know, political people, political activists also um, work on these fields. What are the issues that are uh, necessary to deal with in the different countries, but maybe also especially for, for Roland, who's working in our e uh, office in Brussels, and also for Peter Scherer on the European level? Like, what are the, the important issues to tackle from a left per, uh, perspective, from a trade union perspective, and maybe also on the international level? in general. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, hello and uh, thanks a lot uh, for um, giving me the possibility to speak uh, about the, uh, let's say, the EU bubble. Uh, so I apologize uh, a priori that I have this Brussels-centered uh, viewpoint now. Uh, nearly 10 years being in Brussels is kind of changing your mind. Um, so if we talk about, um, let's say, the, the broader political background of our ongoing social uh, and labor struggles, obviously, um, let's say the development of capitalism is, is the background uh, on, on kind of on which we have to, to struggle. And um, when I came to Brussels, when I started working in Brussels in 2009, um, it was a pretty horrible situation because um, that was the time when the international post-Lehman Brothers crisis hit the EU. And um, that was the point when the EU changed dramatically uh, the internal balance of power in the EU changed completely, and the rising Germany took over uh, Europe. So um, that was a very frustrating time for us, because basically, I, I remember still when, when I had the kind of, uh, how to say, when, when I applied for the job, I was asked, why do you want to go to Brussels? And I still remember how I uh, talked in wonderful, fancy ways of what I would like to do and how we could uh, develop the EU. We started working in the Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung office in Brussels, and all we did was just defensive struggles for the beginning. This changed in my understanding, at least for, for me. There was one very interesting thing happening in the last years, and that was the trans-European struggle, even transatlantic struggle against TTIP. For me, this was really a, a, a major point where I learned a lot about this monster of the EU. Um, contrary to everything, or oh, uh, contrary to a lot of hopes of radical leftists, there was never, ever a window of opportunity for another integration process after the crisis. I know there have been a lot of texts being published that the crisis would have opened a window of opportunity and there might be now kind of a, a kind of elite internal learning process for a different integration of uh, the EU. When in 2009, and especially in 2010, uh, the crisis really hit the institutions of the EU and you woke up in the morning and suddenly there was a new institution over, built up overnight. Uh, you woke up two days afterwards and billions of euros were suddenly there to be pushed into the financial market. Um, there was 
the, they, I, I visited a lot of uh, neoliberal think tanks uh, at that time. So for one or two months, I really tried to, to uh, go to as many of their meetings, so from the dark side, as possible to learn what is their thinking. At not a single one, they used the term crisis. There was no crisis for them. There was only opportunity. Because the left had no answer to what actually happened, the left was divided on what we could, what we have to do to react to the this big capitalist crisis. So, in 2010 and the following years, I was pretty frustrated because I had absolutely no idea how we could influence this monster in Brussels. And then TTIP started, and our Rosa Luxemburg office in Brussels has been involved in these anti-TTIP struggles from the beginning. And um, I think every cent we spent on this anti-TTIP uh, movement was uh, the best invested uh, money, uh, resource uh, we, we ever did. Um, what we did was supporting a network of networks, the so-called Seattle to Brussels network. Um, we supported them. We helped them organizing uh, meetings in Brussels and uh, with the literature uh, we produced and gave it to them to distribute. So there were meetings regularly in Brussels where maximum, let's say, 120 people met from all around Europe. But this was enough. Okay, of course, this kind of the top of the pyramid, because these 120 people then went back to their distinctive places and, and work places. So kind of, uh, let's say, the uh, elite of these uh, NGOs and social movements, etc., met in Brussels. But these were not more than maximum 120 people. And these 120 people, organizations behind them, really put terror in the heart of the neoliberal center in Brussels. They freaked out because there was a movement, coordinated movement against TTIP. And for me, this was wonderful. Again, I went to their neoliberal think tanks to listen to what they actually were aiming at, what their counter strategy against us was. And they had no counter strategy because we were better. We had the arguments, we had the people. We had a broad uh, movement far beyond any kind of political family. Um, so farmers organizations, all kind of trade unions were there, uh, um, uh, city governments were there. and. Um, they really freaked out at their meetings. Uh, they really openly let out their hate against us. And this was just wonderful for me to see what we actually can achieve. And um, it's, it's just, sorry, bullshit if now the media says that the right would have stopped TTIP. That's not true. It was the left. It was the left in the United States and in the EU. And we nearly achieved the same with CETA. Um, I was, um, how to say, I was tired, we were overworked uh, with uh, TTIP, but we achieved so much. So this is just one example of what we actually can do. The moment we start focusing on uh, a specific issue, even in this undescribable multi-level government system EU where nobody knows, okay, actually where's the power? Okay, because it's always moving. The moment we start to coordinate, uh, we can achieve uh, a lot. Um, I add two more sentences to give an example of what we should focus, for example, in the future. So we, with TTIP, we managed to stop the trade agenda. Now, internally in the EU, the, um, the left has learned to tackle the European Commission. We also have learned to understand a little bit the European Central Bank. So, therefore, uh, leftists meet regularly in, in, in Frankfurt, Blockupy, um, and, and, and work on this, especially on 
awareness rising for the general public. But there's one institution the left is very weak to understand what actually it means. It's the European Court of Justice. Uh, there is no, at least to my knowledge, no social movement. You, you don't even get uh, radical left literature on the European Court of Justice. Um, but there, there are studies that the Court of Justice very, very carefully recognizes if there is social pressure against their coming decisions. The moment they realize that there are demonstrations, not in Brussels, but decentralized, against their coming verdict, they change it. This is absolutely, for me, it's absolutely astonishing because I thought uh, they would be kind of closed, uh, unreachable. So this is another example what we should focus on in future. Thanks. Okay. Thanks, Roland, for like sharing this this experience of uh, transnational campaigning that you were part of with the Brussels office. And maybe I would like to to ask Peter to also bring in his view of like what can and what needs to be changed also in the policy of uh, of the EU. Yeah, uh, thanks a lot to Roland that he did he he. In a in a very good way, he he described uh, that alliances are possible. Yeah, and and uh, Ananya, when you when you, in your contribution, I put down alliance building. Yeah, that is what you used, uh, and I think that is important. And we, and in particular, when I see what is coming in the next two three years, the the and and when I see the election results of the last. Uh, six months, yeah, and in various countries, uh, among that in Germany or Austria and so on. In in May 2019, we will have a European election, European Parliament. That Parliament will look completely different. That is for sure, 100% uh, clear that it will look different. And in the Parliament, we have we have unfortunately, and that is the charm of the European uh, uh, Parliament. It is quite often much more easy to organize alliances between, let's say, progressively thinking people. Uh, that is, is easier, and it is. It goes sometimes. Uh, it has nothing. It has nothing to do with your nationality. It has sometimes not much to do from what uh, policy group you are from, either the Social Democrats or the Left or the Greens. Uh, so you have various alliances, and but unfortunately, uh, I, I I fear the next Parliament will look uh, very different. And one reason more that we should work together and uh, Goran you said uh, when you when you said about NGOs and trade unions yeah you said uh, there is no sense in this competition and I would say there is no sense for example in the competition of our of our foundations for example of our uh, when we are in a in a left corner where we where we have uh, quite a few things really in common then unity is uh, is more needed than ever before and it's possible and let's work on that and ha and and have instead of uh, having always uh, the what what has, what is uh, yeah dividing us uh, put forward what is it uniting us and 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 I think I see that we really can that we really can do can do that uh, uh, more successful unfortunately there is one one thing I I, uh, um, I have to say and that is a bit uh, that is owned to the weakness of our political uh, of our political part of the political scenery and it's it's quite often that we are anti yeah and Roland you said anti TTIP yeah and it's quite often that we are that we yeah and in particular for example in my job one part of my job is lobbying and that nobody sees that when I'm when I'm in the parliament when I see for example now the European Commission is thinking about a new company law some directives in company law or a directive for European 
uh, insolvency uh, uh, rights, yeah, or the, the insolvencies, they want to do some framework, a framework directive on insolvency. And insolvency is quite, is for workers, is very important. In some countries, insolvency goes like that, and next day you found a new company, and you can get rid of the workers, yeah? And uh, what we want is, of course, we want to have an information right, that we know what's going on, and we want the protection of uh, the, uh, of all what the workers, uh, what the company owes the workers, yeah? And in particular, what accumulated over much Sometimes they work there 20, 30 years. Their pension is in the company, and they are not they are not creditors like anybody who sold the company's uh, pencils or so. Yeah, they are preferential creditors, and we want to have that in. And we have, of course, still some very liberal thinkers in the Commission. They would like to have it different. They would like to make it as easy as possible. Yeah. So, and that is, uh, and for that. I need alliances. I need people in the parliament who see that from our angle, and and that is that is the magic word: alliances building. Yeah, we we have to do that, and we need that more than ever before. Yeah, and one last remark to my initial part: the the solidarity, the very concrete solidarity uh, in in company cases, or when it's when it's about uh, closures of plants and so on. There, I simply would say, uh, solidarity is not a one-way road, and we, and it uh, again, there was in the presentation, there was one uh, one time mentioned trust building. Yeah, it is trust building in multinational companies. The workers among themselves, the representatives from various plants, they have to work together, and there, there, for example your foundation here can play a very positive role. Get them together from company X uh, all over Europe. Get the workers together. The trust building is important when you want to exercise jointly solidarity. Thanks a lot. Um, I think I'll open the panel now for, for your contributions also, the discussion for your contributions. Milos, you can maybe bring in the mic and uh, yeah like I try to open two questions like what can we do to improve our trans our cooperation and I think there were quite a lot of ideas here already in the panel I would be really interested in what you can maybe uh, what you think in addition or maybe in uh, also maybe differently and also what we need to change as a um, you know as a broad left um, in terms of the political conditions we work in in and how we can build alliances? Well, I'll start as a comment and then mm -hmm. as a proposal. <laughs> uh, first, the comment. Uh, I would say that uh, as an ex-trade unionist, uh, I found uh, ev every time astonishing this communication gap between the levels of the trade unionism. For example, when I talk to the, when I talk even now with the trade union uh, official or trade unionist uh, activist in the company, he or she is frustrated when saying, "What do I need from this uh, Brussels? I don't know what the hell are they doing there. I don't." need them. When I talk, uh, or when I was talking with the trade unionists, which are professional trade unionists within the ETUC uh, in Brussels, they are frustrated because they don't get any information from the trade unionists in the company level. Because the trade unionists in the company level, uh, they don't uh, give any information to the trade unionists in the sectoral level. So this is extremely big problem. It's a two-way frustration. Uh, so because, for example, I give you one information, there are about uh, according to the estimation, which is three years old, uh, 30,000 corporate lobbyists in the Brussels. 30,000. How much are there uh, trade union lobbyists? Not 30,000. And 75% of the EU legislation is a direct consequence of the lobbying of this, of this vast majority of these lobbyists. So the EU legislation, legislation is not per se legislation. It comes down as an interest legislation. It comes down to all the company level trade unionists. So I think that. Uh, there will be much more done if the, this communication gap would be broken, that the, trade, that the company of a trade unionist would then go to the sector of trade union and say, okay, we have a problem here, can you help us? And then this information would go up also to the Brussels, to the trade union in Brussels. For example, who knows here about your wage convergence uh, activity? I don't think that, that, does anybody know about that here? The, yeah. So, because you know, this is really important thing. 
You know that the wage convergence activity or action is the action how to converge or to you know go with the wages from the east basically more to the west. Uh, and now this is the action which DETC is doing. For example, transmission belt would be the national trade union center. Yeah, yeah. Of course, this is the problem. Where does the information stuck? If you uh, think as Brussels and the, the whole thing of the EU legislation is an enemy, you're out of the game at the beginning. And this is the problem with trade unionists, uh, not only on the company level, also on the national level. They don't see the Brussels as something which they can influence, sometimes simply because they don't speak English. They don't know English. So they, they cut off the, all the communication because they are simply ashamed of uh, admitting they don't know the language of the European Commission. And I would, I would say that this is really a daunting task, but it, it's a necessity uh, to do uh, in, the, in this way. And the proposal is a bit, I would say, broader. Uh, it's not only the wage conversion alliance that nobody knows. For example, the revision of the posting directive, which is now a really big thing in the European Parliament. Also, lots of trade unions don't know what is the revision of the posting directive. Here in Croatia, it, w it would have and it will have a big impact. It means equal pay for uh, the workers, on, for the same workers at the working post. Equal pay, not the minimum pay, equal pay. And this is now happening in the European Parliament. And it will affect all the posted workers uh, from Croatia, from uh, any of the EU states which are going abroad. So I would say that we need more as you were saying, information, and the proposal is concrete that uh, what are European Works Councils? What are international framework agreements? How can we use these resources? Let's make workshops on the operational level like this, so that somebody comes and to say, and to, uh, to say what is European Works Councils? What is Works Councils? How can we collaborate with the NGOs? So to make, make things really operational, what, is in, uh, framework, what are international framework agreements? We talked about that three days, but nobody knows this, or, or this, uh, some uh, people People, of, of course, no, but from the NGOs, lots of people don't know that. How can we use bilaterally all these resources? I would say that we really need more operational level workshops to deal with that issues concretely. Somebody comes from the European World Councils and says this and this and this, we do this and this and this, help us to do this and this, and we will help you to do this and this. Okay. And I would think this is mm -hmm. a proposal. Thank you for these concrete proposals. Who else? Um, Nina. Bet okay. Bettina, Tony. And Nina. Also. And Nina, okay. Very short questions for uh, Peter and Anja. Thanks a lot for this. Uh, is there, I mean, given that we accept the narrative of markets as, as the only way forward, and like I think Roland said, capitalist development is, or you, Peter said, is the factor which we live, is there anything in your campaigns when it's globally and internationally, when you address others, is there any other narrative that you can offer? So when you have British you know, in German having different interests because they see a change having different benefits to them. Is there anything common? I know, you know, it's a difficult question, but I wonder because you see it in practice. Is there any other narrative other than markets and competition that you can offer? You know, how do you, how do you convince the workers from such different points of view and interest that there is something to cooperation? In what kind of narrative do you, do you tell that story? If, if there's any at all. I mean, after the, you know, once upon a time, we had the Communist International, we had the Socialist Countries. There was some hope and some kind of alternative narrative. We lost that. So what do you use that today other than markets? And then a uh, question to Roland, what kind of arguments? I mean, I'd love to hear. Because it sounds like you offered certain arguments against market integration, against markets being, again, the ruling logic of the world and of interest of all, which prevailed. So I'm, I'm curious, was it empirical studies? Was it, what, do you, what did you use in, in, your, in your campaign? Thanks. Uh, thank you. Okay, I don't. I don't have a question. Uh, I have a, a quick addition to the uh, to the discussion. I wanted to point out. I mean, uh, I'm aware that the focus of this conference was to to discuss mainly methods of kind of activist uh, union work, uh, activist organizing or NGO organizing uh, in terms of uh, defending labor rights across uh, global supply chains. Uh, but there is also legal recourse available that could hugely benefit of transnational labor solidarity in 
fighting labor rights violations across global supply chains. We have private international law, which is basically uh, an area of law that, that governs relations between private individuals, companies uh, that are in different countries that basically we could use to actually sue multinationals if, uh, if we wanted to pursue that path. Uh, there's a famous case of Walmart, you probably, you probably have heard of it, that was successful in this case. So workers were successful in fighting Walmart for conditions uh, that were actually uh, neglected by the supplier of Walmart. Um, so there is also this path, and I don't think we've discussed, discussed it uh, enough. Uh, there is also uh, CSR initiatives, which we consider as soft law, so something that we couldn't make that much use of. But actually, the soft law can become hard law because uh, in Companies have codes of conduct. Companies have standards for suppliers. This was, for example, case of Walmart. It had standards for suppliers, which was basically it was a, like a company in an internal act, but that went into the contract with suppliers, and then it became legally enforceable. And that is how they were able to actually be successful. Uh, and it's similar with other multinational companies. Many, many have uh, now, when this is becoming more and more popular, and uh, consumers also demand some some kind of uh, corporate or social responsibility. Uh, many have these de these issues uh, written down in their codes of conduct. We do, however, need to make use of that. We have works councils, European works councils or national works councils. For example, in Slovenia, unfortunately, we're not really uh, a country that has a seat of or headquarters of multinationals. But in, in our, <laughs> well, yeah. Uh, in our country, Works Council actually has uh, has uh, jurisdiction to to talk with management and to get uh, get a view into the contract with suppliers with uh, their um, basically any contractual partners. They can they can actually see the contracts. They can influence what goes into the contracts if, of course, they have the right methods in in pursuing their work. So there's there's many things that we could we could really make use of, not just in terms of uh, organizing campaigning that we discussed most in this conference. Uh, so yeah, I just I just wanted to put that out there. Okay, thank you. And then the last one is Bettina and then I'll give the floor to you guys for like, uh, I don't know, a round of two minutes each quick answers and uh, additions. Um, yeah, there's also, for instance, the, the European Center for Constitutional and Human Rights in uh, Berlin that is suing um, KIK, the German <coughs> um, textile discounter, uh, on the on the Ali Enterprise case in uh, Pakistan, where the factory burned down and hundreds of workers um, were killed. Um, what I actually wanted to say, I'm Bettina and I'm coordinating the work of the Clean Clothes campaign in uh, East and Southeastern Europe. And uh, we found through um, in-depth research in, in almost all the countries of the region here, Europe, Eastern Europe and Southeastern Europe, that the most dramatic um, um, issue is wages. And uh, that there's a huge gap between the actual wages of the workers and the living wages. Um, and um, uh, we decided as a group of uh, uh, organizations <coughs> here in the, in, the, in the region that our main focus will be um, the issue of uh, wages, the demand for a living wages. ETUC is doing the, the pay rise campaign and I think there's a lot of um, you know, uh, uh, possible opportunities for synthesis, and um, um, also I think uh, in the in the demand of uh, for a Europe uh, EU minimum wage policy. My question uh, would be particularly to you, uh, Peter. Um, uh, what the strategy uh, of ETUC is following the pay rise campaign? Um, in the direction of a, of a, 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 a EU minimum wage policy. Thanks, Bettina. Um, I would start maybe from the left, the, the radical left part of the table. So, um, <coughs> Roland, uh, I think the specific question to you was on the on the arguments and the narratives used in the anti-TTIP campaign. 
finally I'm called the radical left. So perfect. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Um, uh, the, so on, on the TTIP campaign and the uh, literature we produced there, that was, um, I think the, the basic clue was to explain to the people the so-called FTAs, free trade agreements, are everything but free and on trade. They are agreements, yes, but not on trade and not free. It's not uh, any longer about trade of things, but basically what they do with these things is they do not attack, not even they attack our economic systems, what they attack are our societies. Basically what, what is really being produced by these FTAs is uh, new constitutionalism. Uh, they, they, they really change the constitutions without telling us. And um, I take always my father as an example. He's a, let's say, uh, well, there could be more politicized persons like him, but he's generally interested if something is happening. And the moment he heard about the so-called ISDS, Investor State Dispute Settlement, so where uh, enterprises can sue the state for future profits they might have gained, this kind of style, and um, by private uh, law systems, um, he was absolutely shocked. Before, he said, well, TTIP is good because uh, America is our friend, so we should deal with them. Then he heard about uh, these uh, sp specific law systems being introduced, and there he said, okay, this is against even the basic bourgeois idea of our democracy. So that the thing. The other point now, very specific to, to your question on, on a kind of anti-market discourse, uh, not so strong. I can tell you that uh, one of my projects is on industrial policy, and I always make the jokes that I stop this project the moment the left has learned using the word planning again. And I think I have to go on with this project a little bit longer. Dobro što reći nazav ono što smo se i barem ja jasno izjavio solidarnost i zajednički rad u svakom slučaju da po meni to uopće nije tema za diskusiju. Da i gotovo. E sada kako dalje sa tim tu ću se složiti da postoje nekoliko nivoa, a prvi i osnovni nivo je fokusiranje na određenu točku, na određeni problem i rješavanje tog problema bez obzira li se radi o nekom većem širem ili manjem teritoriju i prihvaćam dopunu kolege iz Slovenije kad kaže da je to stvarno čudno kako ta komunikacija među sindikatima specijalitom vertikalnom dijelu u koji puta stane. Pa ja se s tim slažem, to je jedan problem, ali mislim da se taj problem nalazi u principu u samom sustavu sindikalizma. Oni koji su u sustavu, to tako radi. Mi koji nismo u sustavu, to je problem mog sindikata, koji bi to htjeli raditi, nemamo priliku. To je jedna stvar i završit ću jednom malom šalom koja će pokazati da tolike mislimo slično kada pet individualno izuzetno pametnih ljudi koji su sindikalne vođe bilo gdje gledaš i promatraš i staviš ih i svaki od njih je pametan, očekuješ nešto dobro, staviš ih u jednu postoriju, staviš za jedan stol, kažeš da je to sastanak i da se piše zapisnik, jer dobro to ćeš dobiti glupi zaključak. To je isto tako nešto frapantno, ali nažalost istinito. Evo. Mislim da to možemo preći jedino na način kao što je kolega predložio izgledati izgradnjom povjerenja susretima i pomaganja jednima drugima bez obzira jesmo li u sistemu ili nismo u sistemu. Ja ne prepoznajem sindikalca je li član jedne u drugi ili član druge u drugi, prepoznajem jedino šljakera u najvolji. I on treba dobiti svoju pomoć. Ok, hvala. Thanks, uh, thanks, Tomislav, especially, uh, although I hope that, uh, you know, we are more than five intelligent people in this room, and I do, and I do hope that, and I do hope that we prove, well, even, I think we even have more than five intelligent unionists here, but, uh, and I think, and I hope that we produce a, a, a not so stupid results with this, with this weekend, but let's see how, what, <laughs> Like this is up to everyone's opinion. Maybe uh, the next one, like the next question to Ananya, um, there was like the specific question also from, from Tony on the narrative that you used to produce solidarity in the Asia Flow Ridge campaign as an alternative to the narrative to com of competition and markets. 
Um, I, actually, I would like to speak to that a little bit with regard to my local trade union work and the way I find it useful to work with workers. <laughs> Uh, most of the workers that I work with are uh, migrants and um, from uh, rural to urban um, areas. Um, actually, market narrative is absolutely not helpful and not something that we focus on. What uh, works more is really the search for human dignity. Uh, search for human dignity and dignified citizenship. Um, these, these really work because we are talking about uh, workers who are socially marginalized. They could be like in the Indian system, Dalits uh, from the caste system, women, migrants, so on and so forth. Now, when you have social marginalization, this is something the left has completely abandoned, but capital hasn't. Capital uses social marginalization very carefully to um, you know, recruit the right type of workforces for the right type of sectors. But given the fact that the left has abandoned this area of uh, narrative, it is uh, not because of that, but th there is a vacuum, basically. There is a vacuum where workers still have to kind of come into their own identity that is very important to them, not just as workers, but as women, as former uh, agricultural laborers, as whatever their identities could be, and to build social uh, unity. The other piece is that to really uh, enable workers to see themselves again as drivers of development. This is something that workers tend to forget, that you know, if they stop working today, the company has nothing to show. So, so this is, again, you know, how are they the agents of, of development? The, so this is at a you know very capsule version of sort of local narratives at the Asia Floor Wage Alliance level. Uh, it it's really we I think that um, I'm not saying it was a deliberate or intentional use of narrative. What what all what we all respond to in Asia definitely is the history of colonialism that is part of Asia. So, and how the type of foreign direct investment and the uh, type of uh, capturing of the economies is going on is another form of colonialism. And this is at a gut level, people really respond to this. Um, however, we don't want to get into uh, regressive nationalism, you know. so. What uh, seems very important to do is to also focus on the fact that capital does not work at sort of national levels. European capital looks at Asia or Africa or you know American capital. So they don't look at just India. You know, it's India in the context of the region. So, so it's very, very important for uh, this, uh, for not just activists, but also the governments to think regionally. And this is a big failure. In the Southeast Asia, the ASEAN is, you know, a more uh, of a viable uh, entity. In the South Asia contest, SARC, which has basically died and died because of the Indian government killing it. Uh, the the SARC is something that again we still continue to you know um, look at that. So regional regionalism is is very important. So yeah, these are some of the narratives. Yeah, thank you a lot. And then maybe to the regional projects uh, in Europe and the question specifically also on the pay rise campaign. Yeah. Uh I would like to react first on Goran, who said uh, we need more exchange and more 
uh, yeah, more seminars and information and so on. And there I would really say, yes, uh, Rosa Luxemburg Foundation can play a really a, a very positive role organizing it. And I repeat what I said, uh, it is needed that the acting colleagues in the companies uh, who organize solidarities, that they get together, that the acting local trade union colleagues get to get to know each other on the when when they have a specific industry and so on and of course the foundations can can do not that uh, cannot have a a program for training of uh, hundreds of seminars so but targeted and doing it is a target doing it in a targeted and in a focused way i think it can be very very helpful and and of course it's a long term project such thing uh, then uh, with regard to the narrative uh, i said that we have 89 uh, member organizations and we have for example a member organization in poland it's called solidarność and you know that the government is pretty close or the solidarność and the government are pretty close and uh, or for example for example, we have uh, Nordic uh, uh, trade unions, uh, and Roland was uh, referring to the uh, example of TTIP and campaigning. The Nordic trade union, or the yeah, I can think, I think I can say the Nordic trade unions were were not anti TTIP. Yeah, they said there is something good in it. So we are not strictly against it. And we have to somehow, we have to have the nice uh, target to write something down which is uniting this. And that is uh, sometimes pretty difficult. And that is the reason why it often, and some, some people say, oh, that is uh, the typical uh, Brussels way to put it, yeah? Uh, that means it's not really very sharp and very crystal clear in one direction. Sometimes we have to make simply Compromises, and we would like to have them all on board. And that is a reason why in our resolutions you will find quite often the word just. We need a just transition. We need a fair uh, treatment of workers. We need decent work. Uh, workers have to live in dignity. And uh, the, the minimum wages have to guarantee that, uh, that the workers can live from that in dignity. Yeah? And that is quite often the case that we have to find ways around and not being specific when we when it goes to yeah let's say the the capitalism uh, the the uh, critic of capitalism and the negative uh, uh, the negative yeah uh, the negative uh, the 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 destructive part of it that is we do not have such a debate where we we have of course it's it's always it plays a role but it's very difficult to have a a proper narrative and easy narrative but uh, i would say to in the sense of uh, to you to get all of them uh, on board it is necessary to to find uh, ways to express what we want in a very, very fundamental and in, in a way a bit in a philosophical and, and, and in a very human way and not precisely in a legal way, for example. There we certainly have immediately, we have, uh, we have different opinions among our membership and that makes uh, European work so difficult. And with regard to the, you said, the minimum wages, yeah? Minimum wage policy in, in the EU. Yeah, and that is uh, there we have again uh, uh one very difficult issue is that we have a divide in Europe and that we have a, a region where we have 80%, 85% density, trade union density, that is the Nordic countries, uh, where the trade unions are pretty strong, where we have coverage of uh, collect by collective agreements, which is 80, 90, even in some industries, 100%. They do not have a problem to negotiate. They can negotiate because they have the strengths, but we have other regions where the trade unions simply do not have the strengths and where we have a, a, a coverage of uh, by collective agreements, even our home country, Germany, 50% almost. It's not any more in the in the upper region. Yeah, it's DGB says 50%. So it's it's just half of uh, of all the work is covered by collective agreement, uh, and we have some uh, regions where it's it's below 20, and that makes it difficult when it comes to the instruments because some of the trade unions they simply say we don't want to have a, a, a legal provision. We do that by negotiation, and and even the Italian trade union 
Union still say we do it by negotiation. We are not in favor for a, a law which uh, is defining our minimum wage. And that makes, the dif that makes it so difficult to have one clear demand for the for the minimum wage and but but we initiated this pay rise campaign is one of of our internal debate and it shows partly our weakness to find common ground yeah yeah it's it's pretty clear and it shows who supports the campaign and and who is who is rather let's say rather hesitant. yeah pardon hesitant Hesitant. Yeah, that is a nice. <laughs> that is a nice word. Yeah, emotionally everybody supports it, but actively, yeah. Uh, I mean, how much have you heard? For example, my home organization, IG Metall. What would have it cost to say, in our demand now six percent, and uh, the lower ridge of uh, the weekly working hours, it would have cost the IG Metall nothing when they declared that this is a demand to say, by the way, in Europe we have a campaign, and uh, the campaign, is, campaign means mm -hmm. workers have to have a proper pay rise and earn more, and with this demand, 6% is not nothing. Uh, compared with our inflation rate, 6% is, is a good demand. They could have easily said, with this demand, we support the European campaign. Unfortunately, they did not. <laughs> now we are getting to the complicated things again, you know, like when we talk about the practical campaigns and who contributes and who not and for what reason. But I, I have to say that, example, first of all, it's my home organization. Mm -hmm. I'm disappointed. Secondly, uh, because uh, uh, Germany is the strongest uh, uh, economy in mm -hmm. Europe and the metal workers are one of the strongest and, and all, all mm -hmm. our uh, partners organization the metal workers uh, uh, trade unions around Germany the the, the British uh, the, the 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 Belgium the French and so on they all wait until the day is coming when IG Metall says we demand this and that mm -hmm. it's, it's of course in a way it has it's a, it's a natural leading uh, uh, position yeah mm -hmm. and uh, they have to and it has an effect on the neighboring countries and that is this responsibility should be more paid attention to. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. This is kind of bringing us back to the question of uh, the, the responsibility maybe of the stronger and the weaker partners in, uh, in this kind of uh, transnational cooperations. I want to thank all of you in this room, here at the panel, in the, in the audience, or like uh, all of those also who contributed to the discussions, not only now, but also during the whole two days we were talking with each other. I hope that uh, every one of you can take something with themselves as uh, something that you learned, something that inspired you, something that you may think of, uh, of an issue in a different way or in a new way. And uh, if you have any suggestions, like Goran, for example, my, made uh, in terms of like what also the foundation could do, um, please let us know, talk to us, send us an email. We are quite open to discuss any, everything with you. We might not do everything, but you know, this is how it works. Um, we consider everything. And, um, and then, uh, you know, talk to you. And I think um, what, what we wanted to show in a way with this conference that is that there's a lot of people who are interested in these issues of organizing, of broadening the base, rooting the base of trade union struggles in our different contexts. And I see that as, of course, a, like, a, like a, a new fight, like trying to fight for hegemony again, like um, of, a, of a way of talking about class politics again, and especially about a class politics that is feminist, that, is, uh, that takes questions of gender, of race, of the different positionings we have in society into account. And then this is also something, just as a comment as one of the organizers, like I, uh, thanks for the comment on the all-male panel this morning. And, um, and we do realize that uh, there's still a lot of things that also we as an organization need to uh, take into account of like in terms of diversity and the diverse and necessary diversity of the voices and of the experiences also in the trade union movement of women, of migrants and so on that uh, need to have a place in our discussions and this is what we are discussing and sometimes 
we can even make it happen in our own events, or I hope more and more. So thanks. I hope you uh, enjoyed it. I think we are going to be thrown out of the hall in, in, in like a couple of minutes, five minutes, okay. Uh, so <laughs> maybe just take uh, your stuff. We will have lunch downstairs like all the days and I hope that we will continue doing the discussions, uh, our discussions in lunch. Oh yeah, thanks to the interpreters for making the conversation happen.